The next part of our inspection is going to deal with measuring cylinder bore wear, cylinder bore out of round, and cylinder bore taper. Now, this could be accomplished with a telescoping or snap gauge and an outside micrometer, but by far the most accurate uh, way to measure these things is to use a bore gauge. So this video is going to deal with setting up and using a bore gauge and how to actually take those measurements. We've got a bore gauge here and a three to four inch outside micrometer, which we're going to need for this measurement. Now I've already calibrated the micrometer, so that's done for us. The bore gauge consists of a dial indicator, uh, the bore gauge handle itself, and we have a variety of adapters. Um, now you're going to have to select the adapter you need based on the size of the bore. And uh, in our case, we're going to use a uh, three inch and 600 thou, and we're also going to have to adapt them just a little bit longer because if I put this together, you're going to see that the, the three inch and 600 thou isn't going to move our needle. We've also got selective thickness washers up here that we can use if we need them. So the idea here is we'll take our handle and we're going to take our dial indicator and we have to put the two of these together. Take the protective cover off and this dial indicator works just like any other dial indicator. As the plunger is depressed, the indicator is going to move around. In order to assemble this so that it's useful, first we're going to have to attach the dial indicator. So what we do is loosen off the thumb screw at the top, and it's hollow, and we're going to insert the dial indicator. Now we have to be careful here not to go too far, and I'll show you what I mean in just a second. What I want to do is very slowly drop the indicator in to the bore, and I'm looking for that little bit of needle movement there. See, at this point, the needle stopped moving. I'm not down far enough. I want to just make contact. The reason for that is, if you see the button on the end, this is what's actually going to take our measurement. So if I squeeze this, you'll see the indicator move. And basically what's happening is, as this button is getting pushed in, a rod is acting on the base of the indicator on the top. If I install the indicator too far, it's going to start taking to the, end, the, the indicator plunger to the end of its travel, and I won't get an accurate measurement. So I want to keep this as high as I possibly can while still affecting the measurement. Next thing I want to do is select the appropriate rod and spacers if need be. Now in this case I know that I want to use the 3 inch and 600 thou rod. This guy's got a bearing on the end of it so it slides smoothly. And the shoulder on the rod is where I want to put my selective thickness washers. So in this case I'm going to add an extra 51 thousandths of an inch. And then another 20. I'm going to install that into my handle. Put the cap on and turn it until it's locked in place. I want to take a second to just talk about the dial indicator itself. Okay. If we look at the face here, we've got a couple of marks. First one here on this side indicates what each increment on the dial indicator means. In this case, we're talking half a thou or five ten thousandths of an inch. What that means is for each of the small ticks, you see there's a small one and then a longer one and then a small one and a longer one. Each of the small one is going to be half a thou or five ten thou, and each of the long ones is going to be a full thou. If you come down to the bottom, you'll see that once we go 180 degrees on the dial, we have hit 25 one thousandths of an inch in half thou increments. So this is going to be really important for us when we start to look at our taper and out of round that we understand exactly how to read this gauge. The plunger here 
you can see it moves on the top as well. So we've got to make sure that we don't put anything over top of this that is going to interfere uh, with the movement of the plunger. Now with the dial bore gauge, this really isn't going to be an issue. And then we have another dial here. And this dial has a thumb wheel on it. And what that's for is if we turn it to unlock it, we can move our ring to zero the gauge, which is going to become important. Before we start actually taking our measurements, I think we better take a second and talk about where we're going to take our measurements. Uh, when it comes to any measurements inside the bore, we want to pay attention to ring travel. Now, this is a fairly new engine here, so we can't see a lot of wear or, or indications of ring travel except at the very bottom. Um, so what I've done is I've come in and I've put a black line with a marker approximately where I would take my measurement at the top. Now what this indicates is the top of the ring travel. Of course, above this there's not going to be any contact with, thing, with anything, so there really shouldn't be any wear. Down at the bottom, we're indicating the lower range of our ring travel. So really all of the wear in this block should come in between those two lines. What we would expect to see is our maximum point of wear very close to the top and our minimum point of wear very close to the bottom. Reason for this, lubrication is going to be greatest at the bottom and least at the top, therefore we should have more wear at the top. And also, once we're at top dead center, on the compression stroke in the beginning of the power stroke, our pressures or the pressures that the rings and the top of the piston are going to be subjected to are going to be our highest. We know that on power, some of the combustion gases will be getting behind the rings and forcing them out against the block, so the highest pressure loading that the cylinder is going to see is going to happen at the top, where we also have our lowest point of lubrication. As far as um, relation to the crankshaft, we should see our maximum wear 90 degrees to the center line of the crankshaft. Again, this is because of our major and minor thrust sides, and we know that the wrist pin is going to allow the piston to pivot in line with the crankshaft, which means that any tipping and transfer of force as the piston crosses over top dead center is going to happen at 90 degrees to the crankshaft. So when we're looking for cylinder wear, we're going to measure at 90 degrees to the crankshaft center line. Out of round, of course, we're going to have to check both. And for taper, we're going to look 90 degrees to the crankshaft center line again. Once I have established where I want to make my measurements and I've got my bore gauge set up, I'm going to drop it down into the cylinder. And the first thing I want to do, I'm going to rock it all the way forward so that the needle doesn't move, and I'm going to rock it all the way back. And I want to make sure that the needle on that dial indicator doesn't go more than a full 360 degrees. When we actually do our measurements, I'll show you why we don't want that. But in this case, we're good. So I'm going to slide up to my top measurement and I'm going to rock the gauge back and forth. Now you'll notice right there, the needle reverses direction. What's happening is, I've hit my smallest measurement, or where I'm totally perpendicular. Right where the needle stops there. So what I'm going to want to do is, find that spot and zero my indicator. So I've zeroed my indicator, and you can tell now that when I go back and forth, the needle stops at that zero. So I'm going to use that when I actually do my bore measurement, but I'm also going to use this as an indication for taper. So this is my measurement at the top. To check for taper, all I have to do, slide down to the bottom and repeat the same thing. If the needle reverses directions on the same zero, I don't have any taper. What that indicates is we have the same size, top and bottom. If the needle reversed direction one full tick down, one of the larger ticks, I'd have a thou of taper. If it was a half, then it would be reversing direction at the smaller. But I don't need to do any actual measurements here to find this out. All I need to do is compare the top and the bottom. 
Similarly, without a round, if I come back to the top, make sure my zero is still good, all I need to do now is at the same point, turn 90 degrees and check it this way. And of course, you can't see it. I'll turn the indicator. Now this may skew my accuracy, unfortunately. And it definitely did. But all I'm doing is checking 90 degrees to my original measurement, and that's how I'm gonna check for out around. So taper, top and bottom in the same plane, out around at the top, 90 degrees out. So I've turned my dial indicator 90 degrees so that the bore gauge will lay flat and it'll make this next step a little bit easier. After I did that, I reset my zero at my point of maximum wear, top of the ring travel, 90 degrees to the crank center line. To find out what the actual bore measurement is here, I'm simply going to take an outside micrometer to the bore gauge and I'm going to use the mic almost like a clamp. to squeeze the bore gauge and turn the indicator back to the zero. This is why it's very important to make sure that when we're setting our bore gauge up, it doesn't go all the way around more than 360 degrees. If it does, we're gonna to have to keep track of how many turns and it just makes this step more complicated. I wanted to zoom in on the gauge here just so you can see exactly what I'm doing with the micrometer. I'm just slowly tightening it until the indicator on the bore gauge comes around to zero. At this point, I'm going to lock the micrometer, remove it, and read it to get my maximum bore diameter. 